global economy. Thank you for joining us. At this time, please welcome to the stage Notre Dame President Father John Jenkins. Thank you. The warmest welcome everyone to the signature event for the 2010-2011 Notre Dame Forum, the Global Marketplace and the Common Good. Notre Dame's forums strive to bring together the highest scholarship across the discipline with the resources of a moral and religious tradition to address the great issues of our day. Yesterday's election perhaps confirmed the old political line. It's about the economy, stupid. We face the greatest economic challenges in this country in 75 years, and those challenges are shaped to a large extent by the dynamics of a global economy about which tonight's speaker has written eloquently. Globalization is in many ways a violent process that creates unemployment in Michigan and Indiana, but at the same time allows millions in India and China to move out of the shadow of rural poverty into the urban middle class. The dynamics of globalization raise important questions for us. What ends ought our economic structures to serve? What is genuine human progress, and how do we assess it? What role should markets, businesses, and various professions play in the achievement of the advancement of societies and the common good? Few could, are better equipped to help us think about these questions than our distinguished speaker, Thomas Friedman, and we welcome him warmly to Notre Dame. And I'm very happy to introduce now our moderator tonight, another widely respected veteran journalist. Nora O'Donnell, the chief Washington correspondent for MSNBC, is also a contributing correspondent for NBC's Today and a regular news anchor for Weekend Today. She is an Emmy Award-winning journalist and a New York Times best-selling author. Since she began at NBC in 1999, O'Donnell has covered everything related to politics from primaries and party conventions to national elections, and we are very fortunate to have her the day after our election. No doubt she had little sleep last night. And it, as if she needed more to re recommend her to this audience, Ms. O'Donnell, an Irish-American, hosted, has hosted NBC's coverage of the New York City St. Patrick's Day Parade since 2007. That will score her a lot of points with this audience. We're extremely grateful that she was able to come on such short notice when Andrea Mitchell had to change her plans. We thank you for coming, and I ask you to join me in a very warm greeting for Nora O'Donnell. Nora. Well, thank you, Father Jenkins, for that very warm introduction. Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be here, delighted to be here. It is true that I'm a graduate of Georgetown University, but I can say without hesitation, this is a beautiful school. It really is. And you guys are all so fortunate to be part of this community. And congratulations to Father Jenkins on his exemplary uh, leadership. Uh, it's true, I'm not Andrea Mitchell, but I am thrilled to be here. We had a late night last night. Wow. Um, Andrea was up till 3.30. Uh, I was up till about 2 o'clock, and then we were both on the Today Show this morning, and then uh, Andrea's show was right during the President's uh, press conference today, so she sends uh, her very best. But we're going to have an excellent discussion tonight. My job, as the Father mentioned, uh, is to serve as moderator or enforcer, uh, if you will, of tonight's discussion. And we're going to talk about the global marketplace and the common good. We're going to start with uh, this presentation by Thomas Friedman. 
Then we're going to have a roundtable discussion uh, with some folks from Notre Dame here, uh, Dean Carolyn Wu, uh, Shanna Gast, uh, a senior here, and Professor Gary Anderson. And then it's your turn. That's right. You get an opportunity to question Tom Friedman. So um, get your questions ready, and certainly I'm sure uh, his presentation will also uh, encourage a lot of those questions as well. So let's get started. It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker tonight, Mr. Thomas Friedman. Tom Friedman is a New York Times columnist who has won the Pulitzer Prize three times and written four best-selling books. His subjects range from the need for a green revolution to Middle East conflicts and from American political dysfunction to globalized commerce. Most journalists like myself, sort of have some mixed feelings uh, for Tom because uh, we're insanely jealous of him. It's true. <laughs> He's got talent. He's success, successful. But of course, uh, we begrudgingly uh, accept uh, that he has been everywhere, interviewed just about everyone, and of course, written about it in clear and concise language that makes us all smarter. So we are so fortunate to have him here tonight. On a personal note, I also have to tell you, too, that when I was coming here, I mentioned to someone that I work with that uh, I was doing this uh, event with uh, Tom Friedman, and they said, well, you know, his wife is so wonderful. She's a first-grade teacher, reading teacher uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and just talked about how she's so great with all the kids. So it doesn't surprise me to hear that, that his wife is really, well, Tom Friedman is a star around the world. His wife is really a star uh, in Washington, D.C., for what she does uh, with children and teaches us all some of the most uh, important lessons in life are children, which is um, the, the love of learning. So without further ado, please welcome Tom Friedman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a treat to be here uh, at Notre Dame. This is uh, my first visit to the campus. I, I know you suffered a, a great tragedy in your community this week, and I want to express my condolences before I begin. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate otherwise. But um, I am I'm really honored. Uh, this is a, you know, when, when Father Jenkins and the Notre Dame community invited me to come here, and this wasn't the sort of normal speech I've, I've given before. It really required me to, to, uh, to do some homework, to try to really put together two themes that I have written about separately. One is uh, globalization and the flat world, uh, and the other is the issue of values, ethics uh, in international affairs today, and particularly in commerce. So uh, I really couldn't figure out what to say, so I decided to give two speeches. Um, and uh, the first is really going to be about the flat world. What do I mean by that? What is the world we're living in right now? because I really can't make sense of the second, the issue of values and ethics in this world, uh, unless you really know the kind of platform that I think we're operating on. And every time I try to do this, I'm reminded of the story when um, they were digging the channel under the English Channel you know, to connect Great Britain and Europe. And uh, they put it out to bid. They got bids of 3 billion euro from one contracting company, 3.1 billion euro from another. Got a bid for 100,000 euro to dig the channel from the firm of Goldberg and Cohen in the East End of London. And for fiduciary reasons, they had to check it out. Sent a team out there, knocked on the door, Goldberg answered, Cohen was on the road. They said to Mr. Goldberg, how can you possibly dig a channel under the English Channel for 100,000 euro? He said, what's the problem? Goldberg will start with a shovel on one side, Cohen will start with a shovel on the other, and we'll dig until we meet. Well, what if you don't meet? So you'll have two tunnels. So, <laughs> I, I, I hope these lectures will meet. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll have two lectures. Okay. So first, let me talk a little bit about uh, the flat world um, and, and what exactly I mean by that. Now, the first thing I have to explain is, um, you know, I made this discovery uh, completely by accident. You know, the world is flat. I wish I could tell you it was all in my head and just kind of came out. It was a complete accident. I became the Times Foreign Affairs columnist in uh, January 1995. And between January 1995 and September 11, 2001, my column really focused on globalization. That was really my interest. 
After 9-11, I spent three years totally focused on trying to understand the roots of 9-11, and I started doing documentaries for the Discovery Channel. We did one on the roots of 9-11, we did one on uh, the wall Israel had built in the West Bank, and in February of 2004, we were sitting around with our Discovery team trying to think up what to do our next documentary on. And at the time, the issue of why does everybody hate America was a hot issue, so I said, let's do that. Let's do a documentary on why everybody hates America. How should we do it? Well, I had this, and this is how it all started. I had this crazy idea that what we should do is go to call centers all over the world and interview foreigners, young people, who spend their days imitating Americans on what they thought of America. And I thought it would make a very interesting kind of double mirror, you know, John by day, Juan by night, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we were literally budgeting that documentary out when John Kerry came out with his blast against Benedict Arnold's CEOs who engage in outsourcing. And suddenly this issue of outsourcing just exploded onto the world stage. So I said to Discovery, wait, time out. Why don't we just go to Bangalore, India, the capital of outsourcing, and let's do a documentary called The Other Side of Outsourcing and try to explain this to every American. So that's what we, we did, set off February 1st, 2004, to Bangalore, India, the capital of outsourcing. Well, we shot about 60 hours of film uh, over a course of 10, 11 days. And across those 10, 11 days, I got progressively sicker and sicker. And it was not the food. It was somewhere between the Indian entrepreneur who really really said, you know, Mr. Friedman, I could read your x-rays from here in Bangalore. And the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to uh, write my new software from Bangalore. And the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to trace my lost luggage on Delta Airlines from Bangalore. That I realized that while I had been sleeping, while I had been off covering the 9-11 wars, something really big had happened in that globalization story, and I had completely missed it. And I, I kept asking all of them, explain to me, what is the platform that's enabling all of this? So our last interview was with a, a dear friend of mine, Nanda Nilakani, who is the CEO then of Infosys, kind of the Microsoft of India, really India's premier technology company. He'd been away during the film. He came back the last day, and he was our last interview. We came to his office. Uh, he and I sat on the couch outside his office while the crew set their cameras up inside. I had my laptop on my lap. And at one point, Nanda said to me, you know, Tom, the global economic playing field is being leveled. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down on my little laptop. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Well, after the interview, my, my mind was exploding at that point. I got back in my Jeep had about an hour ride to my hotel, and I just kept rolling over in my head what Nandan had said, the global economic playing field is being leveled. Then I thought, you know, what he's really saying is the global economic playing field is being flattened. And then in the crazy chemical way these things just happen, it burst into my head that what Nandan Nilakani, India's premier engineer entrepreneur, was telling me was that the world is flat. And I wrote that down in my notebook. The world is flat. I got back to my hotel, I ran up to my room, I called my wife, who Nora blessedly referred to, back in Bethesda, Maryland, and I said, honey, I am going to write a book called The World is Flat. She now says she thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> That's not exactly how I recall the conversation, but I did uh, come home and say to my bosses at the New York Times, Ladies and gentlemen, I need to go on leave immediately because my software, the framework through which I look at the world, is out of date. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a basic engineer and it's a Java world. If you don't give me a leave immediately, I am going to write something really stupid in the New York Times. <laughs> it's a great way to get a leave, I have to tell you. So um, uh, they let me go in, uh, in June. I turned the book in in December. Don't try this trick at home, kids. And um, uh, blew up my forearms along the way. But in a burst, it all came out. Now, what's the core thesis of this book? Because it's very relevant to our discussion of ethics and morals tonight. The core thesis is that there have been three great era of globalization. First, I call globalization 1.0. It shrunk the world from a size large to a size medium. It lasted from 1492 till the early 1800s the beginning of global arbitrage. That era of globalization was built around countries. You went global through your country. Spain exploring the new world, 
Britain, India, uh, France, uh, Portugal, uh, Africa, and East Asia. The agent of globalization was the nation state. Globalization 2.0 lasted from the early 1800s till the year 2000. It shrunk the world from size medium to size small. That era of globalization was built around companies, companies searching for markets and for labor. You went global through your company. The company was the dynamic agent of globalization. Well, while I was sleeping, maybe while you were sleeping, we entered globalization 3.0 from 2000 to the present. It's shrinking the world from size medium, excuse me, from size small to size tiny, and flattening the global economic playing field at the same time. Only what's really new, really exciting, and really terrifying is that this era of globalization is not built around countries. They're still important. And it's not built around companies. They're, they're still important. No, what's really new, unique, different about this era of globalization is that it's built around individuals. For the first time in history, individuals can now compete, connect, and collaborate globally as individuals. That's what's new. How did we get here? Well, I go through 10 flatteners in the book. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'll just talk about the three key ones. The first was the PC. What the PC did, the personal computer, was allow for the first time in the history of the world for individuals to author their own content in digital form. Now that sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook, but let me disaggregate it for you because it's really important. What the PC allowed, in individuals have been authoring their own content ever since cavemen and cave women etched on cave walls. But with the PC, Suddenly, individuals could author their own content, words, photo, data, spreadsheet, video, in digital form, in the form of bits and bytes. And once your content was in digital form, it could be manipulated in so many more ways and sent so many more places. That was the first flattener. It was quickly followed by the second flattener. That's a date. I think the most important date in modern history. And that date is 8-9-95, August 9th, 1995. Because on that day, a small startup company in Mountain View, California, called Netscape, went public. And the world has never been and never will be the same since. Why is that? What was Netscape's invention? Netscape's invention was this little device called a browser. And what this browser did was allow people to illustrate on a computer terminal everything that was locked away in internet files, previously the exclusive domain of computer scientists and scientists. The browser is what brought the internet to life and made it a tool of connectivity that could be used with equal facility by grandma and grandpa, grandson and granddaughter. Netscape also did something else. Because in the morning of 8 9 95, Netscape went public. And that triggered the dot com boom. And that triggered the dot com bubble. And that triggered the crazy, absurd, utterly ridiculous overinvestment of $1 trillion, that's trillion with a T, into fiber optic cable. We, in a space of five years, wired the world with fiber optic cable so much that Shanghai and South Bend accidentally became next door neighbors. Remember all those people on their laptop authoring their digital content? Suddenly, thanks to all that fiber cable, in five years, they could send their digital content anywhere in the world virtually for free. Remember how it happened? Netscape had an investment banker, Morgan Stanley, and they wanted the stock to be priced at $32. Jimmy Barksdale, Netscape CEO, said, no, no, no. If this fails, I want it to be remembered as a $20 stock. 
Netscape opened on the morning of August 9th, 1995 at $71.50. It closed that day at 56, and we all looked at that and we said, woo, there is gold over them there hills. And we went out and we bought every dot-com that moved. You can't fool me, I know they're in your 401ks, okay? <laughs> and when we did, we accidentally funded the massive wiring of the world with fiber optic cable. That then laid the basis for the third flattener. Third flattener was a very quiet revolution. You didn't see it. You kind of had to be a computer geek to appreciate it. But it was a revolution in transmission protocols. You know that alphabet soup of HTML and HTTP and XML and SOAP and AJAX? You don't need to know what any of them mean. All you need to know is this. In five years, what all those transmission protocols did was make everyone's computer and software interoperable. Now, for all the young people here, you just take that for granted. See, you weren't at Notre Dame when they first got computers. Oh, but Father Jenkins, he was here. And he can tell you, admissions, admissions got computers. And um, accounting got computers. They got rid of the abacus down there, and they got a computer. You know, um, there, was, there was just one problem. Admissions got Microsoft, and accounting got SAP, and they didn't connect. So whenever one of your parents didn't pay tuition, someone from accounting had to walk over with a piece of paper to someone in admissions. Just ask your parents. One of them got CompuServe, the other got AOL, and they didn't connect, okay? So this protocol revolution made everyone's computer and software interoperable. So no matter where you were living, no matter what software you were running, no matter what computer you were on, you could talk to someone through that internet on their computer with their software. When you put all three of them together, what you had was the crude makings of the flat world. We created a platform by the early 2000s where suddenly more people in more places could compete, connect, and collaborate with more other people for less money than ever before. When I say the world is flat, that's what I mean. We created a platform for multiple forms of collaboration. And when we did, we fundamentally changed the world. We moved the world from a world where value would be created in vertical silos by who you, by who you, by command and control, went from a world of vertical silos of command and control to a world where value would be created horizontally by who you connect and collaborate with. Friends, we're really going from a world of vertical to a world of horizontal. And that shift from vertical value equation of command and control to horizontal value equation of connect and collaborate, that shift is the mother of all inflection points. It is the biggest inflection point, I would argue, since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And you just happen to be here. It is changing everything. And that gets us to lecture number two, because the first thing is changing. Now I really got to grab my notes. First thing it's changing is how, how we think about ethics. So let me start this conversation by telling you a story. I, I, five years ago, I team taught a course at, at Harvard, actually with Larry Summers and Michael Sandel. I was coming back from class one day. I was at Logan Airport in Boston, and uh, about five o'clock. And I went to buy a magazine. Actually, I bought two. Took them off the shelf, and I went to the cash register to put it down, and a woman was coming from here. Honestly, I thought I got there first. I put my magazines down, and she said, excuse me, I was here first. And she looked at me, 
I know who you are. <laughs> Today, if that happened, I'd say, ma'am, can I buy your lunch? Can I shine your shoes? Just don't blog about me. Put me up on YouTube or Twitter about this incident. I swear, I thought I got there first. Okay. What's that about? What that's about is when the world got flat, what it meant was that anyone who had a blog post was a journalist, was a newspaper. Anyone who had a cell phone camera was a paparazzi. And anyone who had a flip camera and access to YouTube was a filmmaker. Well, when everyone is a paparazzi, a journalist, and a filmmaker, everybody else is a public figure. Welcome to my world. Okay. Everyone else is a public figure. And when that happens, ethics suddenly go nuclear. Why is that? Well, I recommend a book to you from one of my teachers, Dove Seidman. And Dove wrote a book, it's kind of based on the world's flat platform, that's simply called How. And his argument is that when the world is this flat, and so many people can look into your life, into your business, into your school, into your performance, into your teaching, and then go out on their blog or YouTube and tell the whole world about it without an editor, without a filter, and without a libel lawyer, how, how you live your life suddenly takes on a whole new importance. We are in the age of behavior. That's what the flat world does. If I'm a company now, 20 years ago, I had a little PR problem. I hired Hill and Knowlton. Take care of it for me. Today, Hill and Knowlton is hiding in a corner from every blogger with a cell phone and a blog post. You can't have somebody clean up the problem for you. And you, me, our kids, we're now leaving digital footprints everywhere we go. In the old days, you could move to another town. Now your reputation on Google precedes you, and it's there forever. So remember what Mark Twain said, always tell the truth, then you'll never have to remember what you said. Okay? Because you can't run or hide anymore. Privacy is over. And therefore, how you live your life, how you conduct your class, how you conduct your business, how you say you're sorry or don't say you're sorry, matters more now than ever. So kids, be good. <laughs> because you're on candid camera. So the first thing is, we got to get our house right. Now, as I look back on the events of 2007, 2008, a lot of people just think about it as a financial crisis. I don't. I think we've just been through a massive how crisis. I think the story of the last three years was a massive American breakdown in how we did our business and how we interacted with Mother Nature. Yeah, you see, when historians look back at this period we've just been through, they're not going to say this was just a financial crisis. No, they were going to say this is a moment when both the market and, the, and Mother Nature, through the climate system, hit a wall. They're going to say this was the moment when the market and Mother Nature said, this is your warning heart attack. You are growing in an unsustainable way. 
turn back now. How were we growing? Very simple. In simple terms, we were building more and more houses and more and more stores to sell more and more stuff, to be made in more and more Chinese factories, powered by more and more coal that would earn China more and more dollars so it could buy more and more T-bills, to recirculate them back to America so we could build more and more stores and sell more and more stuff to be made in more and more Chinese factories, powered by more and more coal, so China could earn more and more dollars, to buy more and more T-bills, to recirculate them back to America so we could build more and more. I can do this all night. I'm not going to. But that is the loop we were in. In 2007, 2008, that was the year that the market and Mother Nature said, that loop, you keep up with that loop, and you're going to crash. This is an environmental crisis and a financial crisis. And that, friends, is why it was not an accident that Citibank, the ice banks of Antarctica, and the ice banks of Iceland all melted at the same time. That's why it's not an accident that Bear Stern and the polar bear both faced extinction at the same time. Because they both got their house wrong. How so? Well, basically, we were doing the same faulty, unethical accounting in the market and Mother Nature. In the market, we're allowing people to massively underprice risk, to privatize the gains, and to socialize the losses. So we allowed people who sold subprime mortgages and credit default swaps to massively underprice the risk involved in those. We allowed the investment banks and brokers who did that to privatize the gains and those of us who got cheap mortgages. And then when they all blew up, we socialized all the losses on the backs of every American taxpayer. We've been doing the exact same accounting in nature. We've been massively underpricing the risk of emitting carbon molecules. We are allowing the people who do that, from cheap coal and cheap gas, to privatize the gains, all of us, and we are socializing the losses in the form of carbon molecules in the atmosphere that we're charging on our children's visa cards that they will pay for in the future in the form of disruptive climate change. In both the market and Mother Nature, we've been practicing the same dishonest accounting. And that's why it is not an accident that Citibank, Iceland's banks, and the ice banks of Antarctica all melted at the same time. Now, underlying these accounting principles were two values, if you can call them that. The values of IBG and YBG. I'll be gone or you'll be gone. I sell you a subprime mortgage even though you make $15,000 and you're buying an $800,000 home. No problem. I'll be gone. I bundle your mortgage with a thousand others into a bond that I sell in Dusseldorf. No problem. I'll be gone. Oh, oh, when they told you you got the mortgage, it was nothing down and nothing to pay for two years, and now the two years are over and you can't pay for it. No problem. Just walk away. You'll be gone. Those were the principles. Those were the ethics we were living by. IBG and YBG. And underlying them is the real ethical crisis. We were moving from sustainable values to situational values. You see, I would argue the greatest generation in this country built us a world of incredible abundance and freedom because on more days and more ways, they lived by sustainable values, values that sustain Sustain relationships between a banker and his client, between a shopkeeper and his customer, between two neighbors over the fence. Values of honesty, integrity, transparency, decency, and long-term thinking. Somewhere along the way, my generation, we did a lot of good things, civil rights movement, women's rights movement, Vietnam War, but at the end of the day, we turned out to be the grasshopper generation. We ate through all that abundance, like hungry locusts. Now we and our kids, we need to be the regeneration. And the way we become the regeneration is by bringing back sustainable values 
not situational values. Situational values say, I just do whatever the situation allows. If the situation allows me to sell someone who makes $15,000 a year an $800,000 home for nothing down and nothing to pay for two years, and the only thing I ask of them is, can they fog up a knife? No problem. I do it. Sustainable values would tell me I shouldn't. If situationally I can plow up a thousand acres of the Amazon and plant soybeans there to sell to China, if situationally I can do that, I'll do it. Sustainable values would tell me I never should. Now I would argue that in this flat world, getting away from situational values and back to sustainable values is going to be the most important ethical challenge an achievement of the regeneration of the people coming of age right now. Because if we don't do this, friends, we are really in trouble. Because in the flat world, these two giant forces, the market and Mother Nature, their impacts are just farther and farther and wider and wider felt. And remember one thing about the market and Mother Nature, in a world without walls, they are the two most autistic forces on the planet. Autistic in the sense of feeling no human emotion whatsoever. My friend Rob Watson, the inventor of lead buildings, likes to say, Mother Nature, Mother Nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't sweet talk her, you can't talk her up, you can't say, Mother Nature, uh, we're, the stock market's off this year. Could you give us a break? Now, she's just going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And Mother Nature, she always bats last. And she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. Father Greed, the market, same thing. Market is just the balance between greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear at any millisecond around a stock, a bond, a piece of real estate, a commodity. It's going to do whatever the balance of greed and fear dictate. You can't spin it, you can't sweet talk it, can't talk it up, can't talk it down. There's only one way you can affect the market of Mother Nature, and that's with sustainable values. That's the only way we can moderate them. And if we, the regeneration, don't bring sustainable values to the market of Mother Nature, we are going to be more unfree than had the Soviet Union won the Cold War. Because the market and Mother Nature will impose on us constraints on what we can do that will be worse than had the communists won the Cold War. What freedom was to our parents' generation, sustainable values need to be for the regeneration. So we come again back to this question of values. Where, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Well, my first book on globalization was uh, Not the World is Flat. It was a book called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. And I got that name because I had visited the Toyota Lexus factory in Toyota City in Japan. And I was blown away. This was 1998. I watched them building the Toyota Lexus almost entirely with robots. And afterwards, I got on the bullet train to go back to Tokyo at 200 miles an hour. And I was reading the Herald Tribune that day, and there was a little story in the paper about some dispute at the UN between Israelis and Palestinians. And it just occurred to me, you know, these people whose train I'm riding on, whose factory I just visited, are building the greatest luxury car in the world with robots. And these people on page three of the Herald Tribune, who I know so well and live with so long and love so dearly, are still fighting over who owns which olive tree. And isn't that the 21st century? Half of us, sometimes literally half of us, are struggling to build a better Lexus, to modernize, to globalize, to integrate. And half of us are still struggling with the identity issues, ethnicity, religion, place, family, and tribe. And so much of the world today 
is really about the struggle between those two forces. So after the book came out, a friend of mine in, uh, in Silicon Valley asked me to send him a bunch of copies, and I want to share with you this story. Um, I was uh, storing the books, signing them, putting them in the box in my living room, when uh, the delivery man came. And he was a heavy set, middle-aged guy, and I invited him to the kitchen to wait while I was signing. And uh, sitting at my kitchen table, he picked up a copy of the Lexus and the Olive Tree, and he started to leaf through it. After a few minutes, he put the book down and said to me, so uh, the Lexus, that represents uh, technology and computers, right? I said, that's right, you got it. And the olive tree said, that represents community and family and things like that, right? I said, you, I said, you, you got it. You got it. So tell me something, he said. Where does God fit into all of this? I've been in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does he fit in? I had to laugh only because I'd been asked that question so many times while speaking to groups about that book. Indeed, some of the most often asked questions I got are some variation of, is God in cyberspace? Is God in cyberspace? Is God in the cloud? So I started thinking about that. And I actually consulted my teachers, my rabbis. The question is, if God is in cyberspace or not, I finally concluded, it really depends on your view of God. If you think God makes his presence felt through divine intervention, through the hand of God at work in the world, then you'd have to believe that God is not present in cyberspace. Because it's hard to look at cyberspace and say that it's being shaped by the hand of God, given the fact that the most popular websites are pornography, gambling, and pop music. <laughs> now, my own view of God, and this is how I wrestled with this question, it grows out of my own Jewish faith, is different. I share the, pos the, the post-biblical view of God, that in the biblical view of God, he's always intervening. He is responsible for our actions. He punishes the bad and rewards the good. The post-biblical view of God is that we make God present by our own actions and our own choices and our own decisions. In the post-biblical view of God in the Jewish tradition, God is always hidden, whether in cyberspace or in the neighborhood mall. And to have God in the room with you, whether it's a real room or a chat room, you have to bring him there yourself by your own behavior, by the moral or immoral mouse clicks you make. My, my teacher, Rabbi Tzvi Marks, pointed out to me that there is a verse in Isaiah that says, you are my witness, I am the Lord. According to Rabbi Marks, second century rabbinic commentators interpreted that verse to be saying, if you are my witness, I am the Lord, and if you are not my witness, I am not the Lord. In other words, explained Rabbi Marx, unless we bear witness to God's presence by our own good deeds, he is not present. Unless we behave as though he were running things, he isn't running things. In the post-biblical world, we understand that from the first day of the world, God trusted man to make choices when he entrusted Adam to make the right decision about which fruit to eat in the Garden of Eden. We are responsible for making God's presence manifest by what we do. And the reason that this issue is most acute in a flat world, in cyberspace, is because no one else is in charge there. There is no place in today's world where you encounter the freedom to choose that God gave man more than in cyberspace. So what I should have told that delivery man was that God is not in cyberspace, but he wants to be there. But only we can bring him there by how we act there. God celebrates a universe of such human freedom because he knows that the only way he is truly manifest in the world is not if he intervenes, but if we all choose sanctity and morality in an environment like cyberspace 
where we're actually free to choose anything. As Rabbi Marx put it to me, in the post-biblical Jewish view of the world, you cannot be moral unless you are totally free, because if you are not free, you are not really empowered. If you are not empowered, the choices you make are not entirely your own. What God says about cyberspace is that you're really free there, and I hope you make the right choices, because if you do, I will be present. So that's, that's where I think the values conversation starts. Now, one of the things that parents, you know, often ask me is, you know, how do I prepare my kid for this world? Should he take computer science? Should she study math or calculus? Maybe engineering? All of those are important. But I'm a big believer the more, the, wired, the more wired the world gets, the more integrated we get technologically, the more whiz-bang everything becomes, the more actually old-fashioned values become important. How many times have you heard people say, but, but I read it on the internet? As if that's supposed to settle the bar bet. But I read it on the internet. I always say, whatever I hear, don't you understand? The internet is an open sewer of untreated, unfiltered information. (laughs) Yet, this open sewer is now at the center of our lives and our kids' lives. And that's how they're interacting. And that's how they're communicating. That's how they're collaborating. So if you don't build the internal filter into them, into our students, our young people, our adults, and our citizens. If we don't build the internal ethical filters into them, when they interact with this open sewer, bad things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen because you're not going to be over your kid's shoulder every time she's on Facebook. You're going to be over your son's shoulder every time he's surfing the web. And so if we don't build the internal filters in, as we go to this flat world and all these people are interacting situationally, bad things are going to happen. And they do. We saw that at Rutgers last month. When people take a modern technology and use it for the most destructive kind of bullying that it drives someone to commit suicide. So you'll pardon me if I'm kind of old-fashioned about this. Because I don't, I don't believe in any of this whiz-bang stuff. I think all the old stuff, all the stuff you can't download, all the stuff for which there's no iPod app, it all matters more than ever. I'm talking about reading, writing, arithmetic, church, synagogue, temple, mosque, parenting, teaching. All the stuff that happens under the olive tree that can't be downloaded, it happens one-on-one between you and your religious leader, between you and your parent, between you and your peer group, all that stuff, it actually matters more than ever the more the world gets wired. Back in the days when I wrote Lexus in the olive tree, when we still had things called modems, I'm really dating myself here. (laughs) I wrote that if I had one fervent wish, it would be that every modem sold in America would come with a warning from the Surgeon General. And it would simply say, judgment not included. (laughs) You cannot download that. You have to upload it the old-fashioned way, family parents, values, church, synagogue, temple, mosque. Don't buy into all the whiz-bang stuff, all the old stuff, which will give us those ethical filters, matters more today, not less. Now let me simply conclude by, by saying that on this fact, on this challenge, I'm a bit of an optimist. Because I think... One of the great things about America, maybe the greatest thing about America, is that 
if you are designing a country, that when it's at its best, and Lord knows we're not always at our best, but that when it's at its best, can balance Lexus and olive tree, technology and values issues. It is our country. And I still, I still believe that. I believe that very strongly. And so, to conclude, I just want to read you, in fact, the last passage of this 10-year-old book, because I think it's actually still relevant to our whole discussion here tonight. I say America is not at its best every day, but when it's good, it's very, very good. In the winter of 1994, my oldest daughter, Orly, who was born in Israel when I was a correspondent there, whose name means my light in Hebrew, was in the fourth grade chorus at Burning Tree Elementary School in Bethesda, Maryland. At Christmas time, all the choruses from the local public elementary schools got together for a huge performance in the Bethesda Town Square. I came to hear my daughter sing. The chorus conductor was an African-American man and for the holiday song fest, he wore a Santa Claus outfit. The first song the chorus sang that evening was the Hanukkah classic, Ma Otsur, to the tomb of Rock of Ages. Watching this scene and hearing that song <laughs> brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> when I got home, my wife, Anne, asked me how it was. And I said to her, honey, I just saw a black man dressed up as Santa Claus directing 400 elementary school kids singing the Hanukkah classic Ma Otsur in the town square of Bethesda, Maryland. God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great story to end with, and thank you, Tom, and it reminds me of something the late Tim Russert used to always say, it's a great country. <laughs> and now we're going to begin the roundtable discussion, a part of this evening, and then after that we will open up to questions from the audience. So without further ado, let me introduce um, the members of our panel discussion. First, Dean Carolyn Wu. Since becoming dean in 1997, Wu has led the Mendoza College of Business to the top ranking for undergraduate programs in Bloomberg Business Week, as well as other high rankings for graduate programs and for teaching ethics. Her research focuses on strategy, entrepreneurship, and organizational systems, and she practices what she preaches by serving on the boards of several corporations and nonprofits. Please welcome Dean Wu. Our next panelist is Shanna Gast, who is a senior from Overland Park, Kansas, and she is majoring in economics with a minor in philosophy, politics, and economics. I majored in philosophy, too. She has worked with disabled students in Cambodia, interned at the U.S. Department of Education, and is writing a senior thesis on the impact of income support programs on student academic achievement. She is also active in service, research, and policy groups here on campus. Please welcome Shanna Gast. Next is Professor Gary Anderson, whose interests concern the religion and literature of the Old Testament, with special interest in the reception of the Bible in early Judaism and Christianity. His most recent book is Sin, a History, and he is spending this year as a, I know, we all know something about that, don't we? <laughs> Sin, a history. <laughs> and he's spending this year as a senior fellow at the Tivka Center for Jewish Law and Civilization at New York University, working on a book about charity for the poor. Please welcome Professor Anderson. All right.
right, so we're going to kick off this discussion. And I know, Dean Wu, you have a question for Tom Friedman. Absolutely. But I just want to say, first of all, that was a superb so talk. Really As a person who read so many of your columns yeah. and books, you told us that this is a new speech. Yeah. And I just want to say it is quite a privilege yeah, for us at Notre Dame to have this Thank speech you. debuted Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, I want to go back to the sustainable value question. Um, we're told that the line is constantly slipping, uh, even though most of us want to do the right thing. Um, but research also shows that cheating is very pervasive in our society. And despite the desire to do the right thing, the line slips. Why? Wow, that's a, uh, a very deep question. I, you know, I, I, several sort of scattershot ideas come to my head, you know, you know um, something's happened um, in our country that the only way I can describe it is that somewhere in the last 20 years ago, and I'm sure this flat world is part of it, America got short. Everything got short. Uh, quarterly earnings became a national obsession. Um, we've just been through a spate of people who lost their jobs on Twitter, saying things on Twitter. 142 characters is just enough to get yourself in trouble and not enough to make a point, okay? So it's, um, I mean, to me, Twitter is a sign of the apocalypse. I, I really have to tell you, you know, it's just a, it's a, um, uh, and so what's happened is just everything is short. Expectations are short. Um, the dot-com boom, we wanted to get rich short, you know, rich, rich quick. Every, there's a whole set of technologies and uh, economic events that have conspired to just shorten everything. And when everything gets shortened, people look for shortcuts. You know? And I think they look for shortcuts in business, and the, then they look for shortcuts in, in academe. You know, and my, my motto, you know, certainly to my kids and in growing up, was always that the longest way is actually the shortest way. You know? um, and because ultimately, when you build a solid foundation, um, you, you really got a base uh, you know, on which to, to perform and I think to excel. And so, you know, I wish I could tell you what is the answer? How, how do we go back on you know, a different time scale? But just think of what Chuck Prince, the head of you know, Citibank, famously said at the height of the dot com boom you know, when everyone's dancing, you got to get up and dance. Even though he knew he was selling products that would blow up. But everyone was dancing, everyone was looking for his quarterly returns, and, and so he had to dance. And we have to really move, therefore, from a notion of too big to fail to too sustainable to fail. You, you want your, we want our students, our citizens, but our country and its institutions to be too sustainable to fail. Um, not, not too big to fail, because if all you got is big, um, you know, that's not a solid foundation. So I wish I could give you a better answer, Thank but that's you. what comes to mind. Thank you. Now every time I tweet, I'm going to feel guilty. <laughs> no. <laughs> it does serve its purposes in some ways. It is a good news feed, you're right, but um, it can be, can be tough. Jen, I know you have a question for Tom. Yeah, I'd like to also ask about um, sustainable values. You mentioned the parallel importance of reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as the development of ethical filters in our young people, which makes teachers in the classroom very important. How do you suggest we empower our teachers so that they can um, foster these uh, sorts of values in their students? That's a good question, Jen, and I don't, um, uh, again, this is worse than meet the press, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, this guy's a, <laughs> It's just Actually, a, we're going to have some full screens later right, right, said exactly. in the past. And then that's <laughs> right. Um, that's right, exactly. That's right. Um, Tim used to always do that. You said that, you know. Uh, but I guess, you know, people often ask me, because my, my wife's a school teacher, my daughter says a school teacher, people often ask me, what's the problem? What's the real problem with education today? You know, smaller classrooms, better infrastructure. Um, not enough computers. And again, I'm, I'm going to give you my really old-fashioned answer. I, I think it's 95% about parenting and 5% about everything else. I see through my, my wife and my daughter. I mean, kids that, who are fortunate enough you know, to have parents who are, 
ready to raise kids, read to their kid when they were an infant, have books around the house, throw away the idiot Game Boy, turn off the TV, sit over them while they do their homework. Um, those kids come to school ready to learn and able to learn. You know? And those that don't end up being parented by my wife and daughter because the real work isn't being done ahead of time. Now, at the university level, we don't expect professors you know, to, to be parents. You know? um, but uh, you know, it, I just think we have to remember who are the ethical and thought leaders in our society. And, and they're, they're, hopefully they're journalists, good journalists who evince good values. They're, they're, they're good university presidents. They're good professors. They're good TAs. They're good student leaders. But if you're in a position of authority today, in any way where people look up to you, and you have authority over other people, um, you need to remember that there, to bring, if you bring that ethical content to what you do, that you want them to be too sustainable to fail, not too big to fail, too strong to fail, too crude to fail, too mean to fail, um, I think you're passing on a very important life lesson. Do you have anything to add about that, Jima? Did... Um, so I was just wondering, in the absence of good, power, uh, good parenting, what do you suggest we do when someone yeah. starts kindergarten? <laughs> Tom, solve the Next the question, problem. please. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a, it's, it's a real challenge uh, for society, and that's why we have. Um, that's why we have public school teachers. That's why we have good public school teachers. That's why we have special needs teachers. Um, we have an obligation as a society. Um, the kids come first. And the kids don't get to choose their parents. And so as a society, we have an obligation. We have a moral obligation. We also have a tremendous interest in building good citizens and doing what we can. And, and so that's what we do. Professor Anderson. Yes, I thought I'd uh, turn to a famous 20th century uh, Jewish philosopher by the name of Emmanuel Levinas, who uh, was very taken by the importance of the concept of the face in the Bible. Uh, the Jewish Bible. I think of a verse, for example, from Deuteronomy, v'samachta lifnei Hashem, which means you shall rejoice literally before the face uh, of the Lord. And he used that notion of the face uh, in the Jewish Bible to construct a complete uh, ethics uh, because what, um, what he began with was the notion that the moral life really begins with the face of the other. Uh, mm -hmm. In the concrete engagement with the totality of another individual standing right before you, uh, you are called uh, to a certain sense of accountability. Um, the downside, really, of the internet and globalization, which you uh, did advert to several times in your talk, is it allows people an extraordinary uh, ability to be anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And when people are anonymous, like in a crowd, uh, there's a reason why I mean, mob, you have a mob psychology, uh, because the face of the other disappears, uh, and uh, your accountability to anybody also disappears. Uh, the example you gave from Rutgers, of course, is a great example, but there are many others. Uh, the New York Times a few years ago had a long article in the Sunday Magazine about uh, you know, cell phone, anonymous cell phone calls to friends, the way in which uh, uh, kids can be ostracized in groups through media uh, and what's happening. So it all called to mind to me a statement that um, Pope Benedict makes in Caritas and Veritatum about globalization. And like you, he feels there's a great uh, potential good here. Uh, he says the whole world uh, has become uh, neighbors one to the other. Uh, but he also adds that being a neighbor is not the same thing as being a brother or a sister to someone else. So I guess my question to you is, you know, how, how in this world of uh, increased globalization and the anonymity of the internet, um, that's the other side of Netscape, of course, the reason why we have viruses. The great connectivity, of course, allows extraordinary perniciousness uh, at the same time. Of course, Al-Qaeda can also be connected uh, in a way in which Bangalore right. can be uh, to Chicago. Uh, so what's going to guarantee, I'll ask with Pope Benedict, uh, that we become or remain brothers and sisters in the next century uh, rather than simply anonymous neighbors? It's a really important question. You know, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, so it triggers uh, several uh, thoughts again. First is that uh, one thing I've always said is that um, you know, this flat world platform is completely neutral. 
Uh, it can be used by Al-Qaeda, and it can be used by IBM. You know? uh, and so it's all about what values you bring to it. Um, and what I've always told people is if you think globalization is all good or all bad, you don't get it. It, it goes both ways, and it depends right. how you tilt the system and how you, le how you lever it. Um, I'm really going to date myself. Now, I've, I've never looked at Facebook. Because the notion that I have 3,000 friends um, is, is absurd to me, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, uh, I, I have, you know, I, I, I know what my friends are. I, I know what uh, shared values I have with them and how we've built our relationships. And, and I count myself lucky to have, like, you know, maybe 20 really, really good friends, okay, and who I communicate with, not just with email, but try to build real relationships with. And so one of the things, this is slightly off your point, but it's related, is that I really see this a lot, again, around the environmental community and activism, okay? Because, you know, people will say to me, uh, often, young, I, I blogged about it. Oh, really? You blogged about it? I blogged about it. Took care of that problem. You know, <laughs> you, you blogged about it? That's like firing a mortar into the Milky Way galaxy, okay? You, you blogged about it, you know what I mean? And I think, did, you know, did Martin Luther King blog from Birmingham jail? You know what I mean? Did from Edmund Pettus Bridge? I mean, did, you know, these guys weren't just, they, they got people together. We got civil rights in this country. We got women's rights because a million people went into the streets um, or sat down at lunch counters. You know, Rosa Parks didn't blog about the bus system, okay? Um, she got on the bus and took whatever seat she wanted. Um, and I really think one of the cancers out there is this faux sense of activism. Because I, I always tell young people around the environmental movement, I say, you know, because uh, I got to tell you, ExxonMobil, oh, they don't have a Facebook page. They're just in your face, okay? Peabody Coal, oh, they don't have a chat room. They're, they're in the cloakroom of the U.S. Congress where the bags of money get exchanged for votes. So if you want to be an activist, get out of Facebook and into somebody's face. Because your world may be digital, but politics, nor will attest to this, is still analog. Okay, It's still really analog. And so um, I've lately, you said something here, which I'm, you know, if you're in public, Nora's in public, I'm a public figure now. Um, it's scary out there. It's scary out there because, as you said, the dishonorable accuser has enormous power. Mm -hmm. The dishonorable accuser in a flat world, by the time, you know, they set that rumor about you going, it's around the world twice before somebody's even emailed you about it. Do you see what they're saying about you? And, you know, people sometimes said to me, would you like to go into government? I say, I would. I say, really? I say, yeah, I would. I'd like to have a very high position. Really? On one condition. What's that? I get to keep my column at the New York Times. Okay? I'm not going anywhere without my six shooters. I feel really <laughs> sorry for anyone in public life who does not have their own column to define themselves twice a week in the New York Times. Okay? I really pity you, you know, because it's really scary out there. And President Obama, I think, has really wrestled with that in a very frustrating way. You're a socialist. He says he's a Christian, you know. Um, he's had to deal with all the dishonorable accusers. And he's had to do it at a presidential way. And I'm sure there are nights he goes home and he goes into the closet and he just screams with anger about stuff that is written about him. And um, it really worries me because anyone with half a brain and any ounce of talent, why would they want to put themselves out there? You know? And so this really uh, is a concern of mine. When the public space gets that scary, um, how do we attract good people to that public space? Um, is there an optimistic way, though, to look at the technology and that, um, yes, an anonymous person can make something that you wouldn't do face-to-face -to, -face to your brother, your sister, your right. friend, or even uh, or, you know, to your neighbor, 
but that there can be also a power in the internet to um, combat that one Absolutely. lone and yeah. angry voice, and there can be a rising up and a quickly discrediting. It may still exist out there, and if you Google your name, right. it may still be on there, but there can be a mass. No question. Behind. It goes both ways. Yeah. And, and dishonesty gets exposed quicker and called out by more people, and, um, and it gets circulated quicker. And it just really kind of depends where you are on that receiving or giving in. You know, but I, again, I don't want to suggest it's all bad at all, just the opposite. I, I get wonderful ideas from bloggers, you know, reading Iraqi bloggers or you know, Afghan bloggers or whatever. I thank God for that. There's enormous richness out there in the public space if you have the right filters. You know? And so it goes both ways. Um, we have time for some additional questions before we wrap, um, get ready to, to allow all of you to have a turn. So let me go to, to Dean Wu. Yeah, Tom, I want to change the tide a bit to mm. a few words. You said you're an optimist. Mm -hmm. Post-election, hopefulness. Can you string those in some ways for me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's in this stuff here? <laughs> so, um, uh, Well, you know, I, um, if, if, uh, if you follow really what I've been writing for the last uh, couple of months now, you know, look, I, I'm really worried about our country. Um, and um, I, uh, so I was in Tianjin, China, uh, two months ago. Uh, I was at the World Economic Forum in Tianjin. And I hadn't been to Tianjin for about five years. I was there five years ago. I spoke at a clean car conference. It was kind of a dirty, polluted, uh, Chinese version of Detroit. And um, was that a bad? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> um, the old Detroit, you know, the old Detroit. Um, uh, yikes! Um, so, uh, so um, someone is tweeting this. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> Detroit is blogging. Right That's now. right, exactly. I won't be invited there. Uh, Anyways, as I was saying, I was in Tianjin, and um, I, uh, I was at the, the World Economic Forum meeting this summer at Tianjin, and uh, you get there by bullet train from Beijing, leave from super modern Beijing train station, solar panels on the roof, I think, and uh, 29 minutes on the bullet train, 100 kilometers. And uh, you get there to the Tianjin uh, Beijing uh, Convention Center. This building is so big and beautifully appointed that uh, if it were in Washington, D.C., it would be a tourist site. Buses would stop there, tourists would get out, take pictures of it. So um, uh, go in, you know, um, uh, they give you all this information about it, and uh, I looked it up on, I got back to my hotel room on the, on the web, it said the Tianjin, Tianjin Meijing Convention Center um, was uh, constructed. Um, it, Construction began on uh, September 15th, 2009, and it was completed uh, in May 2010. So I was in my hotel room, I went around and see, September, October, November, <laughs> December, January, that's eight and a half months. Now, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, I take the subway uh, to work often, and uh, um, subway uh, at the Bethesda Metro has two escalators. They've been repairing them for six months, okay? <laughs> this is God's truth, okay? And when they're repairing them, they have to close both. They repair one, and the other has to be a two-way staircase, okay, for everyone in the station. So at rush hour, they're too long. You have to wait five minutes just to get up to the, to the mezzanine. And I, the other day when I got back, counted the stairs, 21. So it took China eight months to build a convention center. And it's taken Washington Metro six months to repair two escalators of 21 stairs. Now I know with enough cheap capital, cheap labor, cheap inputs, authoritarianism, you can build anything in six months, okay? <laughs> Could we do that? Could Russia do that? Could Brazil do that? Could Indonesia do that? And so, you see, if you don't travel, what you don't know is that when you fly today from Shanghai to LAX, it's like flying from the Jetsons to the Flintstones, okay? Um, 
And so why is that? What's, what's that about? What's underneath all of that is that we can't act collectively anymore. Now, China acts collectively in part because there's an authoritarian government. Maybe it's 90%, but it ain't all of it. There's also a sense of aspiration, of purpose, of national will, of get it done, do what it takes, pay any price, bear any... Wait a minute. Wasn't that us? That's what's bothering me. I gotta tell you, I didn't follow this election at all. At all. Uh, sorry, no, I didn't follow it at all, okay? <laughs> all right? Because it seemed to be completely irrelevant to our challenges today. And because I am certain that whoever wins, that each one is gonna go to their, you know, whatever their tribal religion is in these two parties, and each one's going to try to subvert the other. And, and Mitch McConnell says the only goal for Republicans for the next two years is to make sure Barack Obama isn't elected president again. Wait a minute, do you people live in a gated community on an island offshore where everyone's 401k is perfect? I mean, tell me where that place is. I want to live there too. What are we doing? How long do we go on unable to act collectively? when so many other people can. So that's, you know. uh, So that's, really, I, it's not, you know, I appreciate the applause. It's not, it's a deep, deep uh, concern of mine. And because the, you know, it's interesting. I think you'll appreciate this, Dean. When I go to China, my Chinese friends say to me, uh, Tom, you exaggerate us. You exaggerate us. To which I say, you bet I do, baby. You're my Sputnik. You're my Sputnik. I, 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 gotta, I put you up in lights because I want people to understand that there's a challenge out there and maybe we can rally because of that challenge the way we did under Eisenhower in you know, 1957 when Sputnik went up. You're my Sputnik and the problem is too many of my fellow Americans, they think you're a shooting star. You're not a shooting star. But you know what really worries me is you exaggerate us. You think we're still Churchill's America? Remember what Churchill said about us? The Americans, they'll invariably do the right thing after they exhaust all the other alternatives? <laughs> I'm not sure we will do the right thing anymore, that we can do the right thing. But what I am sure of is this. We don't have time anymore to exhaust all the alternatives. And we're going to open it up for questions, so if you want to come to the microphones now, I will call on you. Um, to ask Tom our question, question. And, and talking about we don't have time anymore, we're going to have two and a half billion more people yeah. by 2020. On top of it all. Mm. Who you have said, yes. I'll let you say it, who want to be. Like us? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much um, for your question. I really appreciate to it. To our panelists, thank, thank you, you very, much. very much. Let's please give them a round of applause. Tom, as we get the first question, we're sure. going to step forward. Yeah. They're going to move our chairs okay. forward. Um, yes, please. I'm also from DC, so I understand your pain <laughs> with the metro. Um, <laughs> my name's Laura. I'm an engineering and an MBA student mm -hmm. here. Great. Um, and my question uh, concerns uh, globalization and technology. They're growing. And while that's great, it also poses a great danger to sustainability, especially with regards to our values and yes. our increasing dependence on energy. Yes. Sustainability is about meeting our present needs without compromising the needs of the future mm -hmm. um, generations to meet their own needs. But how are we ever going to move beyond our present needs and our thirst for energy and um, to ever develop our values and become a sustainable society? Well, it's a really, really good question. Um, and in a way, I mean, it's, it's, it's I, partly my answer is I wrote a whole book to try to make that argument. So let's, right. But let's break it down, because as, 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 it's, it's a perfectly legitimate and important question. You know, the first thing is you have to know what world you're living in. And again, one of the things that's tragically happened um, is not only have we lost our collective ability to act collectively, 
but there's been a complete breakdown in authority in our country. All elites, journalism, politics, but also science. Okay. So we have a lot of people running around saying, you know, climate change is a hoax and this or that, you know. Um, now, if there's a climatologist who thinks climate change is a hoax, I really want to hear from them. Okay. But I don't want to hear from a politician that it's a hoax, any more than I want to hear their views on you know, uh, quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, you don't, you're not entitled to an opinion about quantum mechanics. You're not entitled to an opinion about the laws of gravity. And trust me, the climate science is exactly in that realm. But no problem. I try to be tactical about this. So my book is called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. So when I'm speaking to a group where there's skeptical people, and I really believe the first thing, the most important thing, I think for environmentalists and young people who want to uh, go into this, you have to learn how to speak to people who don't believe or share a single thing you believe. That's really, really important. So I actually spend a lot of time thinking about language, how to sell things, sell my ideas, how to name things. I'm a really big believer to name something is to own it. And so one of the things I tried to do, first of all in my column, was to rename green. See, one of the problems with green all these years was that the people who named it were actually the people who hated it. They actually owned the definition. They named it liberal, tree-hugging, sissy, girly man, unpatriotic, vaguely French, vaguely French. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Gore, you're looking a little French, okay. Well, I'm here to tell you, green is geopolitical, geostrategic, geoeconomic, capitalistic, patriotic. Green is the new red, white, and blue. Oh, yes, it is, baby. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, okay. So I try to take the language and then argue from within that. And so then when people say, look, I don't believe in this climate change stuff, I say, take out my book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Take out an eraser, just erase hot. You don't believe in hot? No problem. That's between you and your beach house, okay? I mean, I, I believe in hot, you don't. That, that's. But how about flat and crowded? How about a world where more and more people can see how we live, aspire to how we live, and live like we live? How about a world that's also going to go from 6.7 billion today to 9.2 billion just by 2050. Now in a world where flat meets crowded, where more and more people can live in American-sized homes, drive American-sized cars, and eat American-sized Big Macs, what do you think, I say to them, is going to happen to the price of energy? And what's going to happen to energy consumption? And therefore, what's going to happen to the environment? So sometimes you have to come at a pro just take it out of this language and put it in that language. And then you can say, well, if, if that is where energy is going to go, my gosh, energy is going to be renewable energy, clean energy, because we certainly can't supply that with dirty energy. We won't be able to breathe, and China knows that. Um, that means energy is, going to be the, energy is going to be the biggest industry in the world. So when you're telling me climate change is a hoax, we don't need an energy bill, what you're basically saying, well, gosh, what if, what if in the IT revolution, Google were a German company, IBM was a Swiss company, Sun was a Japanese company, Apple was a French company, what would our standard of living be like today? If we didn't own the IT revolution, well, what do you think our standard of living is going to be in the future if we don't own the ET revolution? and it's going to be the next great global industry. So what I'm trying to say is you've got to find arguments, a way around people to get them to move, because other thing, otherwise all you can hope for is the perfect storm. And the perfect storm is a storm big enough to finally end this debate but not end the world. And I don't want to wait around for that storm, okay? But it's, it's so important to keep doing what you're doing because I think this is going to change. I, I really do. I think this is a, a generational thing. You go on college campuses today and you know every other student I meet is either concerned about this or wants to go into this field, blessedly so. And any political party that thinks it has a future, 
basing its politics on something that is not believed or shared by 90% of the young people in America today, uh, that's not a political party that's going to have a big future over time. So this will change. But I just hope the problem waits for us. Well, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Uh, sir? Yikes. I can hear you. Yeah. That's okay. You know, it's a really uh, powerful question. Unfortunately, it's really outside my realm of expertise. And uh, we're going to have a reception after, and I know Gary's going to be there. And I'd really urge you to come down and pose that question to him, because I would be completely at sea answering it. But thank you. Thank you. It is a good question very, about yeah, secularism please, and yeah. sustainable values. It's a great question. Hello, I'm a fourth year engineering student and uh, thank you both very much for being here tonight. Uh, this has been a great evening. Thank you. Um, you, uh, you spoke a lot about sustainable values and I think every individual in this room would nod and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, but a lot of the systems that, uh, that influence the global marketplace, um, corporations, government, regulatory bodies, um, have more of the situational values and uh, you also spoke about our inability to act collectively. Um, how, how would you suggest, and this might be, this might be an unanswerable question, sure. but how would you suggest that we bridge that gap between mm -hmm. the individual sustainable values and the systematic situational values and get those more Start to change things. each other? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. Um, my own feel, where I'm gravitating to is, um, because uh, I do get to travel around the country a lot and, and meet people, and um, you know, I think there's a huge tea party in this country, but it's not the one you've read about. Um, uh, I think there is a radical center in this country uh, that feels deeply unrepresented uh, by a duopoly of, you know, a two-party duopoly that is basically bankrupting the country, taking turns in office doing it. I think the country is ripe for a third party. And um, I've written this uh, already, but I really believe it. You know, when you think that Ross Perot, you know, at one point had 30 to f maybe up to 40 percent of the vote, you know, when he uh, mounted his third party challenge um, in the Clinton uh, Bush one, you know, election, and uh, ultimately got 18 percent of the vote. Um, and because of Ross Perot, and he got a little nutty at the end. He thought little black helicopters were chasing him, you know. Um, uh, uh, because of Ross Perot, Bill Clinton made deficit reduction his number one priority. Because of Ross Perot. And that had a huge impact on our economy. It was to the good of, of all of us. Now, I don't know if he's going to run, but imagine a third party that Bloomberg did run. Um, uh, someone who has experience running a city, um, who believes, you know, I think in a lot of really good, balanced, progressive measures. He couldn't win because the whole party system and the 
electoral college is stacked against a third party. But I don't think you have to win. I would just love to see a presidential debate, you know, where you had a really smart third party candidate in the middle, just saying, you know, when, you know, on any issue you, you can imagine, you know, budget cutting, you know, taxes, investment, clean energy, and could actually put on the table the right things, you know. Because see, what's frustrating about our country right now, I think, is that it's not like we don't know the problem, know the solutions. We need a gasoline tax, okay? We need a gasoline tax. Um, think about it, if we had a dollar a gallon gasoline tax phased in over 20 months at five cents a month, okay? Um, you could give half to pay down the deficit, half to give a, a quarter to give a cut in payroll taxes, a quarter to give a cut in um, corporate taxes. You, with the gasoline tax, you lower the pollution in the air. You spur innovation in clean tech. You strengthen the dollar because we aren't sending so many abroad, and you take money away from the very people we're fighting in the Middle East, people who have drawn a bullseye on our back. So it's not win-win. It's win, 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 win. Every one of these guys knows it. Every one of them. Yet not one, not one of those 535 people Senators and Congress people will dare propose it. You'd think one of them, going out the door, would simply say, what the heck, you know? <laughs> gasoline tax, <laughs> I'm for gasoline tax. <laughs> nah, bye, gasoline tax. <laughs> one of them. You know, I, 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 I've met, in, in Hot Flight and Crowd, I actually do this riff, I imagine, what if I were in a debate with someone? I was the candidate for the gasoline tax. And Nora was my opponent. Issue comes up, she, I propose a gasoline tax, dollar a gallon. She, well, she, she says, there he goes again. My opponent, Mr. Friedman. Never seen a tax he doesn't like. Now he wants a gasoline tax. Get that, ladies and gentlemen. What would I say? I wouldn't say this to dear Nora, because she would never say that to me. I'd say this to candidate X. I'd say, Mr. X, let's get one thing straight. We're both for a tax. Because if you don't think having your oil price set by the world's biggest cartel isn't a tax, called OPEC, then you're not paying attention, okay? What differentiates you and me is I want my tax dollars to fund American schools, American research, American learning, American hospitals, American roads, American highways, American infrastructure, and you, you seem to want our tax dollars to fund the Saudi treasury, the Russian uh, army, the uh, Iranian uh, revolutionary guards. You seem to be totally indifferent. It's just a little tick I have. I like my tax dollars to build my country. So, you know, if you can't win that debate, you don't belong in politics, you know? So, it's, and the, so the fact that we can't even say that, think about it. The most obvious, you know, one-stop shopping solution to a lot of problems is off the table. Boy, when your known solutions are off the table, you're in a bad place as a country. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm getting I out think, of here. This guy's for, scary. <laughs> I think so, he's for a gasoline tax. Right. I'm thinking that. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm here. Good evening. Um, with the change in government that we saw yesterday, uh, it seems as though everybody ran on an economic platform. There needs to be economic change so on and so forth. Where does the new government find a balance between economic and ethical balance? Is that something that's gonna be left, as you said earlier, on our generation's visa card for us to handle? Or is it something that will be handled in the nearer future? I honestly, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't think in general there's a tension between job creation um, and ethical value. There, there's nothing obvious. Is there something you have in mind on that? Because I, I would say, I think what's, what's frustrated me the last two years in listening to the debate is everyone says, you know, we have to have more jobs. Somebody's job, you know, we job, job, we have to have more jobs. We cannot bail our way out of this problem. We cannot stimulate our way out of this problem. There's only one way we get out of this problem. 
And that's if we innovate and invent and design and sell more things that make people's lives more productive, more healthy, more entertained, more secure, and more comfortable. And we sell them to the rest of the world. And we make them in a way that we get so smart as a country and we get such a good infrastructure and leverage so much technology that one American can do the work of 20 foreign workers. So that one American can be paid the same as 20 foreign workers. That is the only way out of this problem. And what this election should have been about is how we do that. See, I think we're in a phase now where both parties have completely broken down. Why? See, I think we just ended a period of 50 years where to be in politics, to be in government, to be a mayor, a governor, a president, or to be a president of a university or any institution, public institution, we had 50 years where to be the boss was on balance to give things away to people. That's what you got to do, on balance in more years at more times. I think we're entering a period where on balance, to be the leader of a public institution will be to take things away from people until we generate a whole new level of, of savings. So the reason these two parties are stuck is that the politics you need right now is you actually have to raise this tax on gasoline or on carbon, while you cut this tax on corporations and payroll. Okay, You actually have to cut this service, early retirement on Social Security, so you can invest in this service, okay, better infrastructure. So neither one's mantra, let's just cut taxes, that'll take care of itself, or I'm exaggerating both, but you know, let's add more services, health care, that'll take care of itself. Neither one works now. You need a much more supple and subtle combination of the two. Because we're like a couple, we're like a family of two working parents with two kids, and one of the parents just lost their job. It's really what we're like as a country. Now, the wrong thing to do for that family would be just to take their kids you know, out, of, out of private school or whatever, or, or, or take them out of a good school, move to a worse neighborhood, just hunker down save every penny. No, the wise family would say, all right, we're going we're gonna to take a shorter vacation or we're going to go camping instead of to Disney World, but at the same time we're going to use that money so our kids can have better after school lessons so they'll be more competitive in the world. That's the conversation we need to be having. Where should we, where, what world are we in? We know the only way to create jobs in this world is to invent things that make people's lives more productive, more secure, more comfortable, more entertained, and more healthy. And how do we do more of that? That's the only conversation economically we should be having. I don't see anything ethically problematic with that. Um, but unfortunately, that's not actually the kind of straight conversation we're having. And just ends up people saying, you didn't create enough jobs. Jobs? Presidents don't create jobs, you know. It's all about, you know, creating basically an enabling economic environment for, for the market to do that. But we've had just a really dumb conversation about it. And not the kind of conversation I think we need in order to actually create jobs. So I'm, I'm worried going forward. I mean, we're going we're gonna to heal back. Things will come back. Maybe we'll go from nine to eight, maybe to seven, God, I hope. But I think there may be a real structural problem there, going from seven back to four again. Um, uh, because those good times, see the way I look at America is that basically there's a real parallel between the crisis of steroids in baseball and the crisis of steroids on Wall Street. We went through a period where our national pastime, our greatest heroes in that national pastime instead of going to the gym to build up their muscles, injected themselves with steroids to hit Grand Slam home runs and set records. What happened on Wall Street and in the economy is exactly the same thing. Thanks to the flattening of the world, middle class wages completely stagnated in America. And instead of telling ourselves, boy, we got to go to the gym. We got to develop new muscles. 
we got to get fitter, trimmer to run this race. We injected ourselves with steroids called cheap credit, credit default swaps, CDOs. And in both baseball and in the economy, when the steroids ran out, you saw what happened. Thank you very much. Great question. And we have time for, for, for one more question. Ms. Adato, Mr. Friedman, good evening. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Michaels. I'm a 2001 grad from Annapolis, and mm. I'm now uh, one of Dean Wu's first year MBA students. Great. Um, my question is the, the green revolution that you talk about in Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Uh, I believe with all my heart that it needs to happen in order for America to stay the premier economy. Um, what is your assessment of how, it, of how it's progressing at this point? What do you think the biggest obstacle is? And what piece of advice would you give someone like myself where I can go and make, make it happen? Good question. Um, good one to, to, to finish on. So um, it's really interesting. I, I've had two years to go around the country to talk about this book. And had a lot of evenings like this. And you know, it's amazing to me. I'll do a book signing after. And um, how many people come up to me and say, Mr. Friedman, I got an energy idea. You know, um, here's my business card. I've got a new company. I mean, I go back to my hotel rooms after these events. I empty my pockets of business cards from energy innovators. Rock stars get room keys. I get business cards. But they're very, <laughs> they're very exciting in their own way, okay? They're, they are very exciting, okay? Because what they tell me is that our country is actually still alive with people like yourself and so many of the students here. Uh, our country is actually still exploding with innovation from the ground up around energy in particular and environmental ideas. It really is exploding. In fact, if I were to draw a picture of America today, it'd be a picture of the space shuttle taking off. This is my image of America. You've seen the space shuttle take off, all that incredible thrust coming from below. But in our case, the booster rocket, Washington, D.C., is cracked and leaking energy. And the pilots in the cockpit are fighting over the flight plan. So right now, we can't achieve escape velocity in ET to get into the next orbit, the next great industrial revolution. What's the key thing? Um, you know, I, I, uh, Nora and I were talking about her, her boss, Jeff Immelt of GE, uh, earlier. And really, I think, one of America's most talented CEOs. And I had done a management retreat for him when I was working on the book. And um, at one point, Jeff, this was three years ago, threw up his hands, and Bush was still president. He said, if only we had a president who would basically impose all the prices, tax incentives, taxes and tax incentives, regulations and standards, to take all that energy coming up from below and scale it, and we could just take off. If you just impose it, everyone would complain for a month, and then the whole American innovation system would just take off. And I thought about that afterwards, and I, I called the next day, and it actually ended up being the penultimate chapter in my book. I said, Jeff, what you're, what you're really saying is if only we could be China for a day. Just one day. Would it be so bad? So the penultimate chapter in the book is called China for a Day, but not for two, okay? <laughs> and it is my fantasy of what would happen if we could actually put all those things in place. Now, what impact would it have? So I mentioned I was in Tianjin. Guy comes up to me in Tianjin, introduces himself, one of these energy innovators. I'd meet these, I'm like flypaper for these people, and I, it's fantastic, because what's so great about our country and what, what I love most about America is people like Mike Biddle, the guy I'm going to tell you about. In the middle of this recession, almost depression, at a time when the government's energy policy, we have no energy bill. What is so great about America and why I'm ultimately an optimist, there's always somebody who doesn't get the word. Oh, it's what is so great about this country. He didn't get the word. He didn't get the word that you're not supposed to go out and invent the most sophisticated process for recycling, where if you give him any pile of junk, he puts it through his recycling whiz-bang machine, and out come raw plastic materials in the five colors 
that exactly the plastic industry wants. The company's called MB Polymers. I wrote about him. Why did I write about him? Because he's my story. MB Polymers was named last month by The Economist magazine as um, the world's best innovative company in energy and environment. Our guy, our guy. MB Polymers, for nine years, was supported by grants from all of us, from DOE, NIST, um, you know, uh, and the Commerce Department. That's how he got the whole thing going. Our guy. Why did I meet him in China? Because he has 25 employees in California and 250 in China and Europe. Why is that? Because Mike Biddle's company, his recycling company, does what he calls above ground mining. That's how he looks at it. He needs huge piles of recyclable material to put through his factory. and needs a constant stream of them to get the plastic raw material to be recycled back to the industry. So China is about to, in the next five-year plan, and Europe already has, passed a law that says any product that has a battery or an electric cord attached to it has to be recycled at the cost of the manufacturer. That is the law of the land in the EU. It will soon be the law of the land in Europe. Okay. Now you might think, what a terrible burden on the manufacturers. No, because when you have the recyclers out there, you get middlemen who come up and can't wait to collect this stuff because they sell it to the recyclers. So a whole industry comes up. So Mike Biddle's company, our guy, Economist Magazine, number one energy innovator of the year, no business in America. All his business is scaling in, Japan, in China and Europe. Because why? We haven't put in the rules, standards, regulations that would allow his business to take off. And so we do that same thing in the auto field. We, we, we bought Detroit. We bought GM. And, and, and we told them, make smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. Bob Lutz, the former vice chairman of GM, he got this one right. He said to the... Congress and the White House, oh, I get it. You want us to make smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, but you guys won't impose a gasoline tax, so we will have the consist consistent flow of consumers to buy those cars. He said, that's like ordering every shirt company in America to only make size smalls and never asking anyone in America to go on a diet. <laughs> you won't sell a lot of size smalls. So what I'm getting at is this, without a fix, long-term, durable, consumer demand. You will never get the green industry to scale. You will get hobbies. You will get hobbies basically supported by government incentives or local incentives or small businesses, but it will not scale. I like hobbies. I used to build model airplanes. I wouldn't try to change the climate system as a hobby. Okay. So, What's happened here, and Obama's been guilty of this, he'll tell you how much money he's directed toward clean tech. And all these companies, they're out there, they're coming up. Mike Biddle, electric cars, code electric car, rode in their car. But without a price signal, you're not going to have the scale consumer pull for those products. And without that, the market doesn't work. And so, this is just basic market economics, which we refuse to do because we want to run away from the price signal. So what we're doing is we're letting OPEC set the price signal. And they're capturing all the rent you know, from that price signal. And maybe it'll go up, maybe it'll go down. But as an investor, if I never know where the floor is, I'm really scared. Talk to people in the wind industry today. They're getting creamed. I mean, between natural gas and the economy, our wind industry is just wilting you know, right now. So, you know, bottom line is, you know, what I've, been, what I've been trying to say, and this is, I'll just end here, that, you know, in the, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, we had a space race. Who could be the first to put a man on the moon? Uh, only two countries could compete, the United States and the USSR, and there could only be one winner. What, what I really believe is we need now the Earth race, which country can invent the most clean technologies so men and women can stay here on Earth? 
Okay? That's what we need now, the earth race. I want America racing Europe, Europe racing China, China racing Japan, Japan racing Brazil, because I think that way we'd, we'd, we'd really get there, that innovation so much faster. But I, I really believe this, and this is not a jingoistic statement. Unless we trigger that race, we America, unless we lead it, it's not going to happen at speed, scope, and scale. You know, we still are the straw that stirs the drink. For how much longer, I don't know. But I tell you this, uh, you give me a green America, I'll give you a green world. You don't give me a green America, I, 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 I'm not sure what's going to happen. You know, um, you know, China will do this, and Brazil will do that, but um, give me a green America, and we will change the world. With that, ladies Thank and you. gentlemen, a round of applause for Tom Friedman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks also to our panelists, Dean Carolyn Wu, Shauna Gast, and Professor Gary Anderson. Great job. Great to see everybody. Have a good night. There's a reception in the back, and we'll see you back there. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.